Sorry, that took me a second. It kept kicking me out, so I apologize. So uh, thank you again for everybody, you know, showing up this morning. We've got quite a few people in here in Zoom, which is awesome. Um, and hopefully we've got some people now that haven't uh, haven't walked away from social, that still stayed there to, to find us this morning. Um, I want to start off just by introducing myself. My name is Nikki Caboose. I'm the VP of Development for Palm Beach Tech. And uh, we just recently announced a couple months ago, we are now a regional organization um, with members from Miami to Martin County. Thank you, Todd. And um, I want to, thank you, James. Um, and uh, I just want to tell everybody, you know, a little bit about us is basically, if anybody um, is looking for jobs, looking for different panel discussions, workshops, like as this morning, what we're doing for educational purposes. Um, we really, our whole goal and mission is to build South Florida into a tech hub. So we wanna bring all the pieces and all the people of tech together and connecting those dots. So um, we have all sorts of different events around, um, like I was saying, education or talent and workforce development. Um, and of course, anybody that's looking for jobs, we do have our resume distributor and jobs listings on our website as well. Um, I will drop some information in the chat this morning, some different links for you guys to take a look at. Um, and anybody that is here in um, Zoom with us or watching on social, if, it, if you guys wanna drop questions or comments in the chat or in the comments on social, I will make sure to be watching those to get those to Todd this morning. Um, and I also wanted to real quickly, um, I'm gonna share my screen if I can, let me see. Um, because I do want to thank not only our speaker this morning, but we have um, a sponsor as well, um, Ashley Kays from Code Teachers. She actually does a lot of coding for uh, children, and um, she has sponsored this talk this morning. And I'm going to put this up really quick if I can. There we go. Just so everybody can see her really pretty logo. Um, so Code Teachers logo is there on the bottom. And of course, our speaker this morning is Todd Albert. He's the uh, founder and lead instructor at Boca Code. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, what tech should I use to build my, my app. So obviously there's a lot of entrepreneurs, there's a lot of um, startup founders in here that are listening. I'm assuming we've even got some software developers, people that this is, I'm sure, a very interesting topic. And I know Todd is great uh, instructor for doing the workshop, so I know we're going to have a lot of education this morning. Um, and I also wanted to... Um, really briefly because today is 9-11, um, just making sure that um, people know we are still united together. We're not forgetting this day and that it is important to everybody, especially as a country. And so we definitely are thinking of everybody um, that you know went through that day, lost loved ones, um, and of course the heroes from that, that morning as well. So um, just making sure that we're, we're putting that out there. Um, and I wanna go ahead and turn it over to you, Todd. Um, feel free, share your screen, take it away. Let us know more about you. Oh, I think you're on. Awesome. Mute. Thank oh, you. Screen. Yeah, I was on mute there. <laughs> um, let me make sure I can share my screen and yes. So real quick, um, you know, Nikki mentioned code teachers and Ashley K who's also been, you know, really helping out a lot with, with Boca code as well. Um, so we've got a great partnership going and um, South Florida Tech. If you guys aren't already on the South Florida Tech Slack, I put it in the um, in the the chat in Zoom if you're on Zoom, which I want to make sure I bring that up so I can see if anybody needs to holler at me. Um, I just ask for those of you that are in Zoom to just put yourselves on mute just to keep um, any feedback down. But if you have questions, you know, either put it in the chat or come off mute and interrupt me. Um, I'm okay with that. I know what I'm going to be talking about today is very opinionated and I'm okay with that. And I hope you are too. Um, so I'm Dr. Todd Albert. I'm the founder and lead instructor at Boca Code. And we're talking about what technology you should use to build your app. And the short answer is it depends. And so that's it. Thank you guys for coming. Um, you know, I hope you all have a great day. Oh, okay, wait, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go on. Um, I do have suggestions for you, right? So it, the, the talk, the whole theme of this talk is it depends, but I do have some suggestions, right? Yeah. So we're gonna start by talking about what a tech stack is. For those of you who are not familiar, um, it's tech stack is just the combination of products and languages you use to create an application. And there are a lot of different combinations that are used commonly. Um, one of the most common that, that's, that's used globally is what we call the LAMP stack. 
Um, this was the most popular stack for a very long time. And this is where you're using Linux to on your server, Apache. I actually, I grabbed these, these cute little diagrams off of the web, but to me, they're almost, they're upside down because Linux should be at the bottom, right? It's, that's the base. That's what everything's running on. And then Apache sits on top of that to handle your requests. And then you have, you, you use MySQL or sometimes Maria database for, to store your data. And then most commonly it was PHP, but sometimes Perl or Python used for um, rendering the websites and for your business logic. So this is, you'll hear the acronym LAMP used, and this is what it's talking about. Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, or some combination of, you know, the M's and the P's there. This is actually becoming less and less popular these days as some of the newer frameworks, and you're going to see as we, we start talking about some of these newer frameworks um, become popular. One of the old standards, though, that's that's still fairly popular, especially in um, you know large corporations, especially in fintech, is Wins, which is using Windows to run the server, which is a lot more expensive to run and maintain. And then on top of that, to handle requests, they have IIS. They use .NET for their business logic and rendering of web pages, and then they use SQL Server, which is also a lot more expensive to run. Uh, for the database. So this is a this is a very popular tech stack among large corporations and fintech organizations. But if you're an entrepreneur and you're launching, just understand that running a Windows server, maintaining a Windows server, paying for the licensing for SQL Server, this can this can get a bit expensive. Um, the what we're starting to see more of is JavaScript, full JavaScript stacks like mean. So mean uses Mongo as a database, uses Express to handle, which is a JavaScript um, server application that, that handles uh, all of your requests, incoming requests and outgoing requests. And it uses Angular on the front end and Node on the back end. So Angular renders your websites on the user's, on the user's device. And Node is, is also JavaScript basically running on the server, not basically, Node is JavaScript running on the server to handle all the business logic. There are other flavors of this that are also very popular. Like in South Florida, a lot of my friends prefer to use Vue over Angular. So you get this Mevin uh, stack. And I prefer, as, as Dennis pointed out uh, uh, while we were going, before we went live, that um, React is my is my front end framework of choice, and React is actually by far globally the most the most popular. It has about um, eight million downloads a week, whereas Angular has about two million downloads a week, and and Vue is is somewhere in in between, um, but not anywhere close. I mean, React is like standalone by far the most popular. Now, not everybody likes using Mongo for the database. So people turn to real-time databases like Firebase or Firestore. So also becoming really popular is the Fern stack. I tend to use this more than, more than um, the MERN stack. Um, these acronyms you don't have to memorize. These are just like some common stacks you see used. Um, we're gonna go in and show you some of the other ones and, and give you some suggestions. I just wanna familiarize you. You guys, so when you see these names, you understand hopefully a little bit better what they are and what they mean. Another thing that's becoming increasingly popular now is going serverless, which is where all of your technology is just leveraging the cloud. Like Amazon has these Lambda functions. Google Cloud has cloud functions. Firebase has a really good function system. And there are others as well. But by, by leveraging like, you know, Google Cloud functions or Firebase functions, you can build your entire application just in these functions. And unless you're like Facebook size, you're a lot of times you can get in under a free tier for this. So you can have your application fully deployed in a way that that you're paying, all, you know, nothing or next to nothing for for your server. So there's some great advantages to that. And then finally, there's some cross-platform. Um, 
cross-platform ways of building apps like for for mobile there's flutter which is google's newest um entry to the game react native which is basically leveraging facebook's react technology but for mobile and react native has come a really long way in the last five years where to now it's it's basically you get the full power of building native applications but you're building it in react components and then if you're doing more like game development, um, Unity is a really powerful option. There's also Unreal. Um, I oftentimes talk about Unity just because that's my go-to choice. Unreal is is equivalent, basically. They're, you know, they're, it's Coke and Pepsi. You know, everybody's got a preference, but ultimately they're both going to give you diabetes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, James said there's Xamarin, there's, you know, Ionic, there's a million others. Um, these are really the the by far landslide top three that are used though, um, in and you know in terms of jobs, React Native is is where you're going to see more jobs. So if you're looking at learning a stack, uh, one of these stacks, React Native is is the one that has the most jobs. Um, so then you know if you start looking at some of the big companies, you can look and see that they use varying stacks. Airbnb, they're they're simplifying. A lot of these companies use way more than this, but I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go into detail in these particular stacks. I just wanna show you that, you know, how it varies from company to company. But, you know, when you get into some of the bigger companies that have been around for a little while, like a Pinterest, you can see their tech stack is a lot more complicated than a four letter acronym, right? So Pinterest is using Python, Java, Go, Django, and JavaScript you know, just for their business logic and for their, they have five different database systems that they're using and, you know, using Nginx to handle requests. So oftentimes, you know, as a company grows, their tech stack grows. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uber, similar kind of thing, using it, leveraging a lot of different technologies and Facebook. This is the last one I'm going to show. And I, 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 sh I want to end with Facebook here for a reason. Facebook, when it started out, it was PHP. They didn't have React. There was no such thing as React because Facebook invented React years later. Facebook has custom server software. Facebook has, you know, is using four different databases and five different technologies on the, you know, just to, just to render the, you know, the views that you see. So Facebook has become this very complex stack over time. When they started, it was very simple. And this is, this is one of the themes that I really want to stick to today is if you're developing a new application, you don't want to start with this like, oh, well, Facebook's using all of this. That's where I'm going to start. Take a book, take a page out of Facebook's book and say, okay, like Facebook, I want to start very simply. And then as my application grows, I can layer on technology, but this is not where you start. And so that's, that's why I wanted to pause on this, on this one and, and focus on that. All right, so that's the introduction to my talk. But now you're like, okay, great. You told us what all these other people are using, but what about us? What do we use, right? That's what this talk is about. And I told you the answer is, it depends, right? So, but let's get into what does it depend on? There's all kinds of factors. There's no one size fits all solution for anyone. You know, we've got, you know, uh, what is what is there? Um, 17 people in this just in Zoom and then more people on, I know on social. Um, just among us 17 people, if we had 17 different projects, it might be 17 different tech stacks that we want to use that to, to best suit our different applications. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what are your goals? What skills does your team have? What are the varying costs? Which I've you know, been hinting at a little bit, looking at local talent. And, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about tech debt. So the goals though is, is really the, you know, one of the key factors, right? There's a lot of different pieces to this, right? So first, who's your audience, right? Um, Damien just built an app for his mom. He built an app for a single person, right? Good little boy, little, you know, Damien. <laughs> um, he built an app for his mom. 
the audience was one person. Now, of course, it's Damien, so he built it brilliantly and many more people already are using it. But knowing who your audience is, are you building something that's that you just need this app on your phone and it's only for you, right? Or is it something you're just using internally at your company? At When I was at my photo, we built an app that only 10 people in the warehouse needed to use this app and they only needed to use it, you know, maybe once a week, each person. So very different if your audience is that limited or like for a small niche, for example, I have a photo booth app that, that we built at my agency that is only for photo booth operators of which maybe there's 20,000 in the world that use iPads. So we only built it for iPad, that's it. It's only for iPad and we're only targeting photo booth operators that use iPads. So it's a small niche versus wider audience global. Do you wanna become the next Facebook, right? So you have to think about who's your target audience and, and don't think today, think about your, your end goal, right? Where eventually you're, you might take this app. And you know, one of my favorite Russian proverbs is there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. I see this all of the time um, that, that people build something. They're like, well, I'm just gonna build it like this for now. And then eventually I'll do this. And you're gonna hear this throughout my talk today that that's a terrible, usually a terrible idea um, because you build up what's called tech debt, which we'll get to. So try, try when, if you can to build it right, build it scalable from the beginning, okay? Another part of you know, your goals and considerations is what platform or platforms do you wanna to deliver to? Right? Are you just going to be a, you know, are you just building a web application? Is this a progressive web app that can get installed on, a, on mobile devices? Is this for mobile devices? Is it for multiple different types of multiple, multiple mobile devices? Or is it a niche like just, um, you know, just uh, iPad, like our photo booth app? Or is this something you're going to be deploying to desktop, right? You know, think about Slack. It's web, it's mobile and it's desktop, right? I have Slack installed on my phone. I have Slack installed in desktop. Again, another plug, one of the best Slack communities out there is South Florida Tech, Slack, southfloridatech.com slash Slack. If you're not in it, join it. Also Boca Code, we've got an awesome Slack group. Go to bocacode.com, hit join Slack, one click, you're in. Um, or are you deploying to multiple platforms, right? Like maybe you're building a game and you want it to be on the you know <clears throat> Nintendo Switch and PlayStation and Xbox and Apple TV and phones and all kinds of stuff. So depending on where you're building for, you know, might will will definitely alter what technology stack you're you're building. For most of us though, for most projects, I really recommend taking that Facebook approach. Start with the web. The web is one of the least expensive platforms to develop for. And it's and everybody has access to the web on most devices, right? So you can really work out the kinks, start to gain traction, gain gain users, and then if your app actually takes off, then you can then you can worry about building mobile versions and desktop versions and things like that. So for a lot of applications, I really recommend, if possible, start with the web, and then go from there. But also think about that is if when you're building for the web, are you using a technology that can easily be transferred to these other platforms, right? So like, you know, like I was mentioning to, to James, if you build in React for the web, it's really easy to build a React native app from that that can deploy to mobile devices, right? So that's one of the reasons why React is becoming so incredibly or has remained so incredibly popular is because you can build it for the web and then making some modifications to, to make it React Native, you can deploy to every mobile device from there. Also, in terms of your goals, what are your requirements? Is this a really large complex application that's gonna require a larger, more complex tech stack? Or is it something small and simple, right? 
most projects you should start as small and simple as you can, right? Start with your MVP, start with the core, right? I always talk to talk to entrepreneurs, right? Every entrepreneur goes through this process where you have this spark of an idea. You get this spark and you're like, oh my God, I wanna do that. And you start talking to people about it, you start thinking about it and that spark becomes a flame and that flame becomes a blaze, right? And now you're like, okay, I wanna build this blaze, but this is expensive. So go back to that original spark. What was your original idea? First start there and build that, right? See if that gets traction. That's what, you're, that's what got you so excited to begin with. So go back to that original spark and build that. And don't try and build the blazing fire, right? Okay, maybe not a great analogy with California right now, but hopefully you guys get my point. So for that small project, oftentimes a you know great tech stack is using like Python and Django or Node and React, right? And these can scale. Right. Um, Ashley on Facebook says, so true, pay now or pay later, but you will pay, right? Better to plan ahead and save time of refactoring. And that's exactly when we get into tech debt, Ashley, that's exactly what, what we're going to be talking about. So again, scalability, right? So this is another part of your goals, right? What, what kind of scalability are you looking for? And this ties back into that audience question, but there are two kinds of scalability. So, and this, you know, these kind of overlap with some of the things I've already talked about, but there's a horizontal scalability, which kind of goes in two directions. One is being able to go across multiple platforms and the other is being able to serve many users, right? So building something scalable where you can handle different devices and be able to handle a lot of users. So something like web where it can work across a lot of different platforms is a good place to start. And using something scalable like Node or Python on the back end where it can really handle a lot of users is good. But then there's vertical scalability also, the ability to add in new features, right? So you wanna be able to scale vertically too as you grow to be able to layer on new features. And ideally you don't want to be like you know, at least early on, like Facebook or Pinterest or Uber is now where you're having to layer on new technologies in order to handle these new features. So if you start with a solid base, then that you can grow and build and build. And then when you get to the point where you've got thousands of developers and different engineering teams, like, yeah, go ahead, grow your tech stack, but keep it simple to start, right? And then another consideration is maintainability. Right, you want to build code and build an architecture for a plat a structure for your platform that is easy to maintain, is easy to add on to, and is easy to debug. I've worked on projects where you know they've had all these different developers contributing, and the code was garbage and it was unmaintainable. You couldn't, they, they everything was such a mess. It was such a ball of twisted spaghetti that you couldn't go in and fix one thing. And so, you know, in those cases, it's just, you just push the code aside and rebuild it from scratch. And that's actually, you know, that's actually the best move in those, it, oftentimes in those cases is to rebuild. And it can be a lot less expensive to rebuild because you already have a prototype, you have a working prototype. But if you're the project owner or, if you're Al, the project manager, and your team comes and says, we got we to gotta throw out all this code and start again, you're, you're not happy, right? You might be happy with the end result, but you're not happy that all of that work that led up to this is now getting scrapped. And another thing to consider, security, right? Are you, I know what, right now I'm still just asking a lot of questions and talking about things to consider and I'm not all giving a lot of answers, but we're gonna to get to some answers. But I want to get to give you guys all these considerations that you need to be thinking about in terms of your architecture and your tech stack. So security, you know, with your app, do you need to be able to keep company secrets safe, maybe your business logic um, or user information safe? like? credit card information for online payments, or maybe you have personal data like social security numbers, right? So these are things to consider. Something like React or Angular or Vue on the front end 
that the data in there is not secure. The user has access to all of that. So you want to make sure that this data is being kept on the, on the server or in a database and that the user needs to authenticate and to access their information, but can't access others. So these are very important considerations. And then finally, the last one is the development speed, right? How quickly do you need to get a working prototype? Is this something where, you know, oh, by the end of next year, we want to have a working prototype or by the end of this month, we want to have a working prototype. These are very different. And so, you know, if, if you're, if you need a mobile app by the end of the month, you're going to maybe go with Flutter, even though it might not be the best choice long-term, you can build a very rapid prototype in there. So some other things that I listed out to consider are the skills that your team already has, right? Um, whoops, went backwards, sorry. So play to your strengths, right? If you have in your team, you know, uh, a founder that's, or a lead developer that knows Java or whatever, use that, right? Play to your strengths, right? And keep it simple, right? Keep it simple, stupid. It's, the simple is oftentimes better, especially in the beginning. Right. If you get too complicated, it starts to get expensive. It starts to get difficult to maintain. So you want to keep it simple. And on that note, a lot of companies are starting to go towards full stack JavaScript, like that, you know, mean stack, mern stack, fern stack, et cetera, where it's JavaScript on the front end and JavaScript or node on the back end, so that you can have one team that's working on both aspects. And if you're if you're new to this game and you don't really understand when I'm talking about front end or back end, what the difference is, um, Joel Lord, who um, came down from uh, Canada and gave a talk at Boca JS a few months ago and, and really made the best analogy I've ever seen. He said a web application is a lot like a restaurant where the front end is like the dining room, right? That's where, the, that's where your customers come in they, they're seated, they look at menus, they do all these, you know, they interact with the wait staff, right? And then the back end of the restaurant is the kitchen and the refrigerator and the chefs and all the craziness going around and all the hustle bustle and, you know, the secrets, you know, the secret sauce literally is back there in the kitchen, right? But that's not what the guests are seeing. They're just seeing the nice, calm, tidy, clean front end, right? So that's the website is the front end, that's what the user sees. And then what's happening on the server and the database, that's the back end. And if you can use the same language on both places, then it's like having, you know, everyone on your team can be a, can be a chef and can be a waiter. They can work in, in, in tandem. And so if you have a team of 50 people, you might not want your waiters to be messing around in the kitchen and you might not want your chefs to be coming out of the kitchen into the dining room. But if you have a team of one or two, they need to be interchangeable. They need to be able to, to, to move between those two rooms. So if you just have one or two developers on your team to start, which most projects are gonna start that size, being able to use the same technology on the front and the back end is very beneficial <coughs> and can save you a lot of money at least to start. And on this line of saving money, I, I cannot emphasize how important frameworks are. So a framework is like a library that has already pre-built pieces or things for you. And you know, so you're, you're not reinventing the wheel. They're meant to save you time. But not only do they save time, they, they, are, they also help you implement best practices. So when, you are, when you're like, no, I don't want to use a framework, I'm going to build it myself, you're stuck putting the hours and years in, that have gone into what they've already done in these frameworks to making this work. And, and you'll see that for those of you who come to the, to the talk at noon today, I'm giving a talk on you know, building your first website and deploying it. We're gonna, I'm going to show you in the beginning, we're going to start hand coding the website and hand doing the styling. And, and it's very tedious. And then we're gonna bring in a framework and start dropping in blocks of code and crazy things are gonna happen and it's gonna look better and it's gonna work on mobile. Best practices, save time, don't reinvent the wheel. 
<laughs> Todd Stone says, some of us have no developers. Yes. And that's where frameworks come in really handy. Um, but Todd, you should reach out. We can, we can talk about ways to, ways to help keep costs down for you if you need. Um, and this is another consideration is costs, right? There's, there's the, as I mentioned, there's the cost of things like servers. I worked on a project where um, the developers had set this guy up on a Windows server that was, that he was charging, it was, it was like $3,000 a month. He was paying, a, he was paying crazy money to run SQL server. I came in, I rebuilt the entire thing in two weeks. I built the entire th rebuilt the entire application on, on a, a lamp stack and, you know, saving him $3,000 a month. Um, and it was faster and worked better, but that's besides the point. So getting back to what tech stack you should use, this chart is going to look very different to a uh, James Zaka, who's a developer who's looking for a job right now. And he's looking at the top of this chart saying, Ooh, those are the, those are the languages I want to learn. Cause I want to get paid the big dollars. And then, you know, you've got the Todd stone on the call. Who's looking for what developer should I hire? And he's looking at the bottom where things are really inexpensive. So this chart might take a minute to wrap your head around, but basically, the top is the most expensive, the bottom is the least expensive. And then from the left to the right is you really kind of get a sense of how old these languages are, right? Because it's the average years of experience, programming experience that people who do this have. So my, you know, you look all the way to the right here and you see COBOL here, all the way to the right. Why? COBOL, yeah, Al raises his hand, right? I learned COBOL in 1994, and when I learned it, it was already a dinosaur, right? It, it, was, it had already been around so long, I was like, please don't make me learn this, please don't make me learn this, and, and I had to learn COBOL, and it was, you know, it, it's awful. I'm not a fan, um, but this is saying, this is old, and also the size of the circle is how many developers there are, so they're rare. COBOL is actually become a lot more expensive. Yeah, Al said he learned it in 83. It was already old in 83, Al, <laughs> right? Um, so COBOL has actually moved up this chart because it's the COBOL developers have become so rare that, um, you know, that that they're, they're in high demand. So, um, you know, Al just pointed out, it's still being used in the military. It's still being used in a lot of banking systems also. So believe it or not, COBOL developers, since most of them are retiring or dead, um, there's actually a high demand for it. So, you know, James, if you could teach yourself COBOL, you can be making crazy money. Um, so I say to stay away from some of these older, you know, um, Lizzie says she learned Fortran in 83. Yeah, Fortran is, you know, it's one of these old languages. Um, you want to stay away from these. You want to stay in here, right? Right in the, uh, you know, if you could see my cursor, what I'm talking about is in this big um, bunch in the middle here, right? Um, these underlying ones, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, this is the sweet spot, right? Right in here and Swift is in there as well. TypeScript, SQL, CSS, HTML, Kotlin. Um, right in here is where you wanna be, okay? If you go north of this line, you get up into Ruby, Scala, Rust, Go. A lot of people are really excited about those languages, um, but they're, these are expensive. So I recommend staying, you know, staying under this. Rupa points out that state unemployment benefits offices uses COBOL and that's why it's been taking forever for people to get their unemployment benefits. Right? Um, but there's another factor too, like, you know, cause you might be looking at this and see PHP down here and be like, ooh, PHP is really inexpensive. That's what I should be using. But another factor to consider is the local talent, right? What skills do we have available here in South Florida for, for the bulk of you that are joining us here from South Florida? By the way, I'm standing on this really comfortable mat um, so if you see me walking around, I'm like moving around on the mat and my dog just came and laid down across the whole mat. So now I'm like hanging off the edge of it, little, little turd. Um, so 
think about what skills are available in the local in in the local talent pool right and think about the ones that are not in the highest demand right so for example we have some incredible talented php developers here in south florida but they're in high demand meaning you can't hire one okay i have a friend his entire system he's got a huge company his entire system's built on php and he's been struggling for the last two years to find the talent not to find good talent here in south florida to find good talent here in south florida that's available right because they're all taken in php so you have to know the the talent pool a little bit about not just you know not just what languages do we know here and are, are teaching here and are being trained in here in south florida but where is there a, a glut you know where where do you actually have people you know what are the technologies that are are in high enough demand that people are learning them but where there actually are some developers available to pick up because this is one of the struggles here in South Florida is we do have a shortage of tech talent, hence Boca Code. That's why I started it because we need more training for tech talent. Um, so we'll get to that. I'll get to my suggestions very shortly. I'm winding up, but the last thing I want to talk about before we get there is tech debt. And, you know, Ashley on, on social and a few of you got, uh, uh, you know, we've already been hinting at what tech debt is. And I love this cartoon here, right? This is this is a great illustration of tech debt, right? Your your roof is leaking and you don't have time to rebuild the roof. So you hang an umbrella there and the walls aren't standing up yet. So you just stick some columns there to prop it up. This is what often happens when, when engineers are under pressure to get a project done. Software engineers, they take shortcuts. And, and so tech debt is that is that cost of the additional work you're gonna have to do to the system because you took those shortcuts. So like, I think it was Ashley who said, pay now or pay later, right? And sometimes when there's a pressure to launch, you, you say, okay, we'll pay later. And you, you build this rickety system, right? And knowing, okay, we're gonna have to come back and we're gonna have to finish these walls and we're gonna have to finish these roofs. But oftentimes the project manager, the owls of the group, if they're not aware of this tech debt or they have pressure from the owners to, hey, we need to add another feature. We need a window on this building. Um, you know, the engineers are like, you wanna add a window? The walls are barely standing up. How are we gonna put a window in there? The whole thing's gonna fall, right? So you need to make sure that this tech debt is communicated from the bottom up, right? You're, the engineers need to tell the project managers what's going on, and the project managers need to be able to tell the owners, the the you know the the product owner, which is usually like you know your CEO, for example, what's going on, so that when the CEO says I need a window, the project manager doesn't even have to go to engineering. He says, okay, we'll get you a window, but first we have to go back and finish the walls and finish the roof, right? So that's what tech debt is, and there's different types of tech debt. Some of some tech debt is intentional, some is not. Some tech debt is more dangerous than others, right? So we get these four quadrants of tech debt, right? So there's reckless and prudent, and there's deliberate and accidental. So deliberate and reckless is like, well, pff, we just ran out of time. We didn't have time for user testing. Oh, well, that's reckless, but it's deliberate. We knew what we were doing maybe more prudent is, okay, well, we ran out of time, so we're going to ship it the way it is, but we know we have to fix it later, right? Like the cartoon. We know that we hung an umbrella over the roof. We're going to go back and fix that. You know, that was an intentional choice to go to market faster, but knowing that we have something to go back and fix. Um, and then there's accidental, right? Accidental reckless is like, what? I didn't know about that. You know, I didn't know that you wanted users to be able to log in. Um, you know, stupid. This is this is the worst kind of tech debt. Um, but then there's accidental prudent, which is which is when you launch, you get your product out there, and now as users are using it, you're starting to be, oh, this is what they want, and this is how we should have built it. And so now you have to go back and rebuild things, but it's 
it's in a it's a, for a good reason. It's because you're seeing now what um, what users are really needing or wanting. Um, and and Nikki says lack of communication is often the breakdown in any project. You have to have a strong base before building upon you know what you have. So yeah. So oftentimes it's a trade off between launch fast and build it right. And when I had, you know, when I was at the prime of, of Nebular, which was my agency, I had this the two developers that just so typified, they were at the ends of the extremes here, right? I had Jesse, who was a launch fast, and Greg, who was a build it right. And Jesse is incredible because you could be describing a project to him. You're like, what if we built an app that did da 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 da, da and it had this and did that? And by the end of the conversation, he would be like, you mean like this? And you'd have a freaking prototype built. Like before you can even finish describing what you wanted, he already had it built. But it was, the code was a mess. The user interface was terrible. It was not maintainable, but he had a working prototype. On the other end of the spectrum was a Greg. And these, these were both, you know, early in their careers. They've both matured a lot since then. But, you know, at that point, Greg, you, you describe the project and he has a thousand questions for you. And he's on the whiteboard for weeks figuring out what's the best architecture before he even wrote a line of code, right? With Jesse's app, we're already in, you know, on the market, testing, debugging, trying to rework his crappy code before Greg has even written a line of code, right? So the, both ends of the spectrum are, are not ideal, right? You want to be somewhere in the middle. Eventually, I realized I need to put those two together, right? Um, but a famous quote is by Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn. And this is really famous among entrepreneurs. He says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late, right? So this is that, you know, look, software is never done. It's never perfect. Just get it out in people's hands, right? And then worry about the consequences later. And this may be a little extreme, but it really, um, you know, it's, it's saying you got to have that balance, right? Okay. So again, there is no one size fits all solution, but I did promise you, I have some suggestions, right? And reiterating some of the things I've already said, start simple. If you can start with web, right? And for most projects, okay, this is not a universal solution. I'll get to my universal solution in a minute, but for most projects, if you could start with web, React and Node is a really good place to start. And if you really want to argue it, you can replace React with Vue or Angular, but React is kind of, to me, it's a, it's a Goldilocks scenario, right? Angular is too strict. Vue is too simple. React is like right in the middle. It's perfect. Um, we have a lot of local tech talent, which means there are a lot of eager junior developers like a James Zaka, who's like, I'll work on your project, right? So this is good for, you know, for someone like Todd Stone, who has a project, he doesn't have developers, you can pick up developers, um, you know, on the cheap because of this. It is by far one of the least expensive tech stacks, um, including, you know, things like server maintenance and so forth. Um, it's incredibly scalable. And this is one of the biggest problems with things like Ruby, who, um, you know, somebody in, in, um, on social said that they, you know, they, I think it was, I think it was Ashley also said that she loved learning Ruby on Rails. Um, Ruby's great, but it, it, it's only great up into a point. And once you start scaling, it becomes problematic. Whereas Node is the most scalable right out of the box. Um, it is widely supported. Every cloud solution supports Node. And in fact, most of the cloud functions use Node and you can get in, you know, unless you're doing millions and millions of hits, hits a month, you, you pretty much can run this for free. And you can deploy to any platform, web, mobile, desktop, server, IoT, even your, you know, Alexa is written in JavaScript. Um, so start and start scalable. Don't deploy to some janky system because it's easy. Um, start with something like Google, right? <laughs> there's nothing more scalable than Google, okay? And Firebase is a is like Google's Fisher Price, my first DevOps version of their of their cloud system. So you've got, you know, on one end you've got like AWS, which is overly complicated, difficult to get started and build. Um, 
and then and then you know you've got Google Cloud, which is much simpler. But when Google acquired Firebase, which was a real-time database, they realized that the way that that company was doing their DevOps was brilliant. So Google has started putting a lot of their services and building out on those Firebase services. And they now have Firebase functions and Firebase hosting among them. And Firebase hosting, first, it has an incredibly generous free tier. It is infinitely scalable. You can grow to the size of Google, okay, which is amazing. It is by far the fastest of every system I've tested, like not even close. Um, it is 20 times faster than some of the best architecture I've ever seen. And it is one line easy. Literally, Firebase deploy is the command you type to deploy your entire site. And I'm gonna show you guys this at noon today at my talk. Um, Ryan Poole on Facebook is loving the real estate analogies. Yes, Ryan Poole of Real Trade, real estate guy. Of course, he would be loving the real estate analogies. So, but then some of you are on here like, but what about, what about, you know, cause it, again, this isn't a one size fits all solution. So here's my little, you know, flow chart E thing. If you're building a mobile app, consider using React Native and Firebase um, or Flutter, but React Native is, is a better solution for 90% of you. Um, if you're building a game, Unity or, or Unreal, if you're building a desktop application, Electron, right? And you can use Node and React and Electron to deploy to every, every desktop application. So if you notice, you know, you can be building in React in most of these using JavaScript, Node, React, one language, JavaScript across all of these, right? Unity, you also used to be able to use JavaScript in as well. If you're building for the web, I said React, Node, Firebase. And if you're wanting to build something that's really multi-platform, either depending on what you're building, either Electron or Unity are, you know, are really good options. So that's where I'm gonna leave you. Um, of course, again, you know, there's a million other things. So, you know, please reach out. I'm really easy to reach, Todd at Pocacode.com. Check out Pocacode.com. Again, we've got a great Slack community, not as good as the South Florida tech community, but we're, we're growing. And um, also we have another workshop today where we're gonna actually show you all of this stuff like building out an application and deploying it to Firebase. So thank you guys for your time and, and please hit me with any questions you've got. Now's when you come off mute. Any questions, yeah, you guys can take yourself off mute if anybody has any questions or comments. Thanks Al. Oh, I'm sorry, Rupa asked if I could show the last slide again. So let me do that. Sorry about the noisy dog. See, I wasn't lying about the dog. Now I just got my mat back. <laughs> he heard something, had to run off. So yeah, Rupa, it's just um, bocacode.com and Todd at bocacode.com. And actually, while I'm on this slide, I'll give a little plug. Um, we have a lot of um, introductory and advanced courses, um, you know, kind of every, everywhere in between. and. For, um, for all the women, we have actually a Her, Her Future Reimagined Scholarship, um, which, which uh, covers a, a chunk of your tuition. So we have the free workshops like we're giving this afternoon. We also have um, you know, various, various courses, so check us out. Oh, thanks, Nikki put the, the link, bocacode.com in, in the chat. Yes. Yeah, and we will have oh. also, um, oh, I'll make Ed's sure. saying he wants, you guys want. Oh, the slide uh, before that. This slide, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Good point, Ed. This slide, right? There we go. All right, so I'll just leave this here and let you guys ask questions now. And I'll make sure too, for anybody that's um, RSVP'd, through Eventbrite that anything that you want to send to them, uh, Todd, um, sure. I'll send links to, you know, your upcoming workshops, your website, all of that. But if there's anything you want to include, Perfect. I'll make sure to put that in there too. Yeah. And I could, I could throw this deck in as well. A deck would be good. Thanks, Todd. Of course. Dennis, for you, anything there. Yeah. I just get the bill. So, you know, just on this slide, I really want to reiterate that I'm really targeting here 
you know, like entrepreneurs, new companies, right? I mean, but, but really with this technology, you could start small and really grow. And, you know, it's not until you get to be like Pinterest, Facebook, Uber size, where you're going to be having to tack on other technologies. These, these technologies here will get you a long, long, long ways down the road. But are great places, inexpensive place to start in a scalable way. That's really was my focus here. Perfect. And I'm going to, um, I'm just dropping for anybody that's in Zoom with us this morning too. I'm just dropping my email there. So if anybody has any questions about this, wants more information, um, for some reason didn't get Todd's information, wants me to connect them, I'm more than happy to help uh, connect and, and answer questions there as well. And I just threw my my email as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we are, it's right about time. We're actually right at 11. So Todd, perfect with your timing. <laughs> so again, um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I really appreciate it. And we actually had a, a good group watching on social as well. I think we had between 15, 20 people there. So uh, thank you so much, Todd. And thank you everybody for coming. Great. Thanks everyone. <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, See guys. lots of you at noon, I hope. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Nick and Ed. My Thanks.